Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Casey with Pioneer Health and Missions, and it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. The title of today's presentation is, Are We Truly Committed? And this is the question we'll be asking throughout this presentation. You see before you a red rose. A red rose symbolizes love and commitment. And in regards to our relationship with Christ, this is how many of us view ourselves. But are we truly that red rose? Are we truly committed? Our opening scripture today is found in Psalms chapter 119, verse 2. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. For those who can, maybe please kneel for a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together today to study your word. Dear Lord, please give us understanding and draw us closer to you. And may the words I speak be the words that you would have me to say, dear Lord, and guide my thoughts in the direction that you would have me to go. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Are we truly committed? As we saw in that opening slide, a red rose symbolizes love and commitment. And when we're dating someone, it's often a red rose that we give them to signify this. But we don't always start out with a red rose. We might start out with a pink rose, a yellow rose, which symbolizes friendship and joy. And then we work up to that red rose because once we give that red rose, things are getting serious. This is a serious relationship, a loving commitment at that point. Now, as I mentioned, many of us consider our relationship with Christ as that red rose, as having that loving commitment. But are we really, or are we just a yellow rose? And not even just a yellow rose, but a faded and dying yellow rose at that. And why is that? Well, it's because we do not truly seek God with our whole heart, because commitment can only come from the heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So what does that mean to keep our heart with all diligence? Well, it means to keep our heart true unto the Father and Son. Not to have a split heart, not to have a divided heart. Because out of it are the issues of life. Now, what are these issues? Our character, who we are as a person. And who we are as a person is a reflection of who has our hearts. Commitment begins in the heart. Yes, this is what we're seeing here, but what does the word commitment truly mean? What does it truly mean to be committed? Well, for that, let's go to the dictionary. And the dictionary says, it is the act of committing, pledging, or engaging oneself, involvement, loyalty to a cause, activity, or job, wholeheartedly dedicated. So we see here there's action involved with commitment, the act of engaging oneself, involvement, there's activity. And I really like this last part, wholehearted dedication, because that's what we're speaking of here, a loving commitment, a loving commitment. So let's look at the word love, an intense feeling of deep affection, warm attachment, passion, or devotion. Devotion is another great word, and we've heard of loving devotion. So let's go to the dictionary again and to look at the word devotion. Love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause. Profound dedication, consecration, the act of dedicating, the act of devoting. So we see action again, the act of, and we see some wonderful words. But let's take loyalty out of this and let's examine that a little bit further. The state or quality of being loyal faithfulness to commitments or obligations, faithful adherence, fidelity, allegiance, devotion, piety. Great words. We're seeing some great words and see how they all work together. Now, often when we study, we pass over these words. How often do we really stop and examine the words that we are reading? Faithful adherence. What a beautiful combination of words. Faithfulness. Faithfulness in itself is a beautiful word. Let's look at faithfulness. Fidelity, a strict adherence to duty and, faith, and faithful of a promise or faithful of our baptismal vow. Revelation 14, 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. 
So we see two things take place here in Revelation 14, 12. Faith and faithfulness. Faithfulness in keeping the commandments of God and doing so through the faith of Jesus. So let's look to Jesus. This is the best example we have of faith and faithfulness. What does it mean to be baptized, or what is the purpose of baptism? Well, it's about faith, repentance, and committing our ways unto the Father and Son. Now, when Jesus was baptized, he committed his ways unto the Father, didn't he? And was he faithful in these ways? Oh, he most certainly was. Did he do it of his own accord? No. Christ was able to be faithful in committing his ways unto the Lord in being faithful to his baptismal vows by the Father, by the Spirit of God, in the faith that of the Father, was he able to be faithful. So Christ had faith and faithfulness. And the same is for us as well. If we have that same faith, we too can be faithful as Christ was faithful. So let's look at the word faith. Complete trust. Complete trust. I love that. Or confidence in someone or something. Mark 9.23 says, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe. All things. Now what does that mean, all things? Does that mean all things under riches as in gold and silver? No, all things under righteousness. All things under salvation. If we truly have faith, we can live a righteous life. But do we truly believe? Are we truly striving in faith to be faithful? Are we fulfilling our promise? Are we fulfilling our baptismal vow? Let's look at the word fulfill. Carry out a task, duty, or role as required, pledged, or expected. So in order for us to keep our baptismal vow, as Christ did, there's a role we play. There is a duty to carry out. Let's learn a little bit more about that. And to do that, we're going to look at the example of Enoch. Outside of Christ, Enoch is probably one of the best examples we have in the Bible of faith and faithfulness, of truly being committed unto the ways of the Father and Son. He who truly loves and fears God, striving with the singleness of purpose to do His will, will place His body, His mind, His heart, His soul, His strength, under service to God. Thus it was with Enoch. He walked with God. His mind was not defiled by, impure, by an impure, defective eyesight. What does it mean by defective eyesight? Well, Enoch kept his eyes on the things of heaven. This is where his heart truly was. He did not keep his, his eyes on the things of this world or lust after the things of this world. Because it's through our eyes, it is through our ears that our heart becomes what it is. The avenues to the heart and soul are through the eyes and through the ears. And he kept his eyes on the things of heaven. Those who are determined to make the will of God their own must serve and please God in how much? Everything. Then the character will be harmonious and well-balanced, consistent, cheerful, and true. You are each living your probationary time day by day, obtaining your experience as the days pass. But you cannot, I'm sorry, but you can go over the ground only once. Then let every precious moment be employed as you will wish it had been when the judgment shall sit and the book shall be open. Our Lord will judge us according to the opportunities that we have had. What are those opportunities? Well, every day from the time we wake till the time we sleep, we have opportunities to either glorify the Father and Son or glorify self. We have choices that we make at those opportunities with, as those opportunities arise. Those choices are recorded in the books of heaven, the choices we make, the decisions we make each and every day. Enoch chose to glorify God in every opportunity that arose. Enoch had a wholehearted, loving commitment. Enoch possessed faith and faithfulness. Enoch was a willing servant. And willing is a big word here. It's at the heart of all of this. If we are not willing, we will never achieve righteousness. Let's look at the word willing. Having the mind inclined, disposed, not adverse, 
I like that, not adverse. Enoch was willing to allow the Holy Spirit to transform him into the image of the Father and the Son. He was not adverse to the light that he, was, he had been given. By faith, Enoch allowed the Holy Spirit to fashion his life to that of heaven. In faith, Enoch was faithful to his promise, living up to all the light he had been given. As Adventists, we have been given great light, haven't we? Are we living up to that light? Now, the light we have been given might be different to some, than someone, the light that someone has received down the street. They might be living up to the light that they have received, but are we living up to the light that we have received? Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Wow, let's pause there for a second. Only those that are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. If we are ignoring this light that we are given now, there will be no other light. If we are not allowing the Holy Spirit to work within us now, why would we want the Holy Spirit to work in us later? And we read on. It says, unless we are daily advancing in the exemplifications of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. Are we willing to accept the light that we have been given? Yet we have a work to do to resist temptation. Those who would not fall a prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. Well, let's pause there for a second again. We're seeing that word seeing again, seeing and hearing, because these are the avenues to the soul. This is how we let things in. This is why we need to keep what we see and hear on guard. We need to keep our hearts on guard. Now, Ellen White mentions avoid reading. In her day, that was, that was the big issue. That's where everything entered. If she could see our televisions, our computer monitors, and our phones and everything we have now, I'm afraid Ellen White would be writing another 25 million words. She probably would, because we are allowing so much into our hearts, into our minds, via our eyes and ears. And we read on. But like as he which called you was holy, be ye yourselves also holy in all manner of living. Are we keeping our promise in all manner of living? Are we doing what we know to be right in the eyes of the Lord? James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. To him it is sin. And we have been given great knowledge. We have been given great knowledge as Adventists. We truly have. Let's take a look at the light that we've been given. We're going to start out with character. And why is character so important? Well, let's read about it. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of His people. This is our sole purpose. This is how we honor the Father and the Son, by striving for the image of the Father and Son. Through Christ, we truly can live a righteous life. It is faithfulness, the loyalty to God, the loving service that wins the divine approval. Can you see these beautiful words coming back up? What we shall be in heaven is the reflection of what we are now in character and holy service. We're preparing for the kingdom to come, that we might stand before the Father in the heavenly kingdom. Matthew 6, 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the Lord's prayer. Is this our prayer? Are we striving to live by this prayer? Is it a sin to not obey God's will on earth? Is it a sin to not strive for perfection of character? It is a sin. Oh, we're going to have to read that again. It is a sin, a grievous sin, which God cannot tolerate. The wretched inward imperfections developed in our character must not exist a moment longer. And we excuse our sins. But we must cleanse the soul temple of miserable self, which is always taking up the room Christ should occupy. This is the room Christ should occupy. And every time we ignore the light that Christ has given, the Holy Spirit sits on the sidelines. The Holy Spirit sits on the sidelines. We allow something else to get in 
and take up the space that Christ should occupy. Are we closing the door to Christ? Are we allowing hindrances to get in the way? In January 1875, I was shown that there are hindrances in the way of the spiritual prosperity. The Spirit of God is grieved because many are not right in heart and life. Their professed faith does not harmonize with their works. Are we ignoring the light we've been given on hindrances? Well, let's look at some of this light. We're going to start out with appetite. Now, appetite is all-encompassing, and most all of us have a struggle with appetite in some fashion or, or another. Those connected with the Word of God are to study the history of Bible characters that appetite may not take the helm and control the mind. We're going to pause there for a second. She mentions Bible characters and appetite. What characters are she speaking of? Well, Daniel and his companions, for one, they maintained a vegan diet, didn't they? And great things came as a result. And what about Ezekiel? Ezekiel was instructed to live on a vegan diet also, and he also had similar results. Let's read on. It says, It is a sin. It is a sin to reject the light God has given upon the denial of appetite to eat and drink as one pleases. It's a sin. But why is it a sin? Well, it's a sin because we're placing, placing little idols between us and God. And if we are eating and drinking things that we know is going to shorten our, shorten our lives, are we not committing suicide? Are we, is that not murder? And there's more. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Are we putting things into the body which the Holy Spirit has advised us not to? And by doing that, are we causing the Holy Spirit to sit on the sidelines? Let's look at sweets. Oh, this is a tough one. And this picture could have easily been me. I could have put a picture of, of myself up here so easily. I love sweets. I truly do. I could put away a whole cake like it's nothing. It's a struggle for me. This message is as much to me as anyone here watching. I have those same challenges as anyone else. And I love sweets. But through Christ, my friends, we truly can overcome this world. We truly can do all things. And we read, We should not be prevailed upon to take anything into the mouth that will bring the body into an unhealthy condition, no matter how much we like it. Why? Because we are God's property. You have a crown to win and a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Can we shun hell if we're partaking of it? No, we can't, can we? Then for Christ's sake, then for Christ's sake, I ask you, will you have the light shine before you in clear and distinct rays and then turn away from it and say, I love this and I love that? God calls upon every one of you to begin to cooperate with God. Oh, cooperation is such a big word, my friends. And we're going to be reading it a little bit more as we move forward. It is better to let sweets alone. Let alone those sweet dessert dishes that are placed on the table. You do not need them. You want a clear mind to think after God's order. There's a wonderful reason right there that we might think after God's order, not the things of this world. There's so many wonderful replacements for sweets. Fresh fruit in a, make a smoothie with orange juice and, and almond milk. It's wonderful. It's a great transition away from sweets. Or freeze the fruit and you have wonderful ice cream. So there are things that we can use to substitute sweets, if we're willing, if we are willing to heed the light that has been given. Meat. Oh, as Adventists, we know the message on meat. And in the picture here, we even see a mug of beer. And we've been given light on alcohol as well. But let's look at meat eating. It has been clearly presented to me that God's people, that's you and I, are to take a firm stand against meat-eating. Can we take a stand against meat-eating if we're eating it? No, we can't, can we? Would God for 30 years give his people the message that they must give up the use of flesh meats if he did not want them to heed this message? Oh, that says it all. That says it all right there. God didn't give us this message if he didn't want us to heed it. And again, meat is something we don't have to eat. We are in an age of 
where we have so many wonderful replacements for meat. There are so many great substitutes. There's no need to eat meat. Excessive indulgence. Oh, this is all-encompassing. Now, this gentleman we see here on the left of the screen, stuff in his face, that could easily be me again. I love to eat until I'm full. And we could do that even with a good thing. And what about this young man with his face or his eyes just glued on this computer or monitor or, or, or television, whichever it might be? Do you think he's being drawn closer to Christ or do you think he's being drawn further away? Yes, there are some good things we could watch that will draw us to, closer to Christ, but most generally we watch things that keep us not even close to thinking on the Father and Son, but only thinking on the things of this world. So let's look at excessive indulgence. Excessive indulgence in eating, drinking, sleeping, or seeing is sin. It's sin, my friends. And these, many of these things just tie in together. And it's not just these things. But let's look at these things. How often do we eat and drink until we're just eat ourselves into a slumber and we sleep on the sofa for a while just to wake up and do what? Turn on the television or sit in front of our computer and then start the cycle all over again. But it is a sin, my friends. We, we need to really think about what we are doing throughout our daily life. Tea and coffee. Oh, tea and coffee. Or caffeine in general is what this is. This is a toughie for me. This is probably the greatest toughie of all these things we've mentioned for me. And as I said, this message is as much for me. I love caffeine. I love the pick-me-up. I love the way it feels. It makes me happy. It has been the toughest thing for me through the years to give up. But again, through faith, my friends, through Christ, we can overcome anything, even caffeine. Some have black backslidden and tampered with tea and coffee. Those who break the laws of health will become blinded in their minds and break the law of God. Wow, break the law of God. We have been given light. Christ has given us light that, hey, stay away from these things. They're going to cause you to break other laws. And yet we still choose these when those opportunities arise. And we go and we break other laws. If we know we're going to be going and breaking in a law, and we partake of that, whatever it might be, where's the Holy Spirit during all this? Now we've got to realize this is the light of the Holy Spirit. These are the words of the Holy Spirit speaking through the spirit of prophecy. And when we are ignoring this light, is the Holy Spirit joining? Can two walk together if they're not agreed? No, the Holy Spirit's on the sidelines, my friends. We close that door. Let's read on. It says, all these unkind criticism, these exaggerated reports, these envious feelings expressed under the excitement of the cup of tea, Jesus registers as against himself. It's a sin against Christ. It's a sin against the Holy Spirit. We all know what happens when we have caffeine. It makes us a chatterbox, doesn't it? And we start to talk about others. We start, start to talk about our brother behind their back. We start to gossip. And we, we, when we do so, Jesus registers a sin against himself. And if we know this going in, the Holy Spirit's on the sidelines. And we're all the more prone for this to happen. Let's read on. It says, To a user of stimulants, everything seems insepid without that darling indulgence, that darling little idol. This deadens the natural sensibilities of both body and mind and renders him less acceptable to what? The influence of the Holy Spirit. When that opportunity arises and we have a choice, caffeine or coffee, whatever that form of caffeine is, Coca-Cola or the Holy Spirit. We've been given light, and we choose this. We choose the coffee, that cup of coffee. Where's the Holy Spirit? It's on the sidelines. Where's the influence? The door is closed to it. We must be able to say no, allow Christ in. Through Christ, we could have the power to say no if we will only allow the Holy Spirit in. In the absence of the usual stimulant, he has a hungering of body and soul, not for righteousness, not for holiness, not for God's presence, but for his cherished idol. In the indulgence of hurtful lust, professed Christians are daily enfeebling or weakening their powers, making it impossible to glorify God, making it impossible to glorify God. Because we choose to glorify self, and not the Father and the Son. 
It makes it impossible to glorify God. And what do we do? We grieve the Holy Spirit away. Let's read about that. The sin of grieving the Holy Spirit of God and walking contrary to Him has cost many a one to lose his soul. To lose his soul. And this is just tea and coffee. And this could be anything. It's the sweets. It's the meat we've talked of. It could be a bottle of booze sitting in that closet. It could be what we wear. It could be what's in our closet. How we keep the Sabbath. Are we guarding the edges? What is our speech on the Sabbath? Tea and coffee drinking is a sin. Tea and coffee drinking is a sin. And injurious indulgence, which like other evils, as we just mentioned, injures the soul. It injures the soul, my friends. Are we living up to the light that we've been given? Are we preparing to stand before God? God's people must overcome. Those who have received instruction regarding the evils of the use of flesh foods, tea and coffee, and rich unhealthy food preparations, and who are determined to make a covenant with God by sacrifice will what? Will not continue to indulge their appetite for food that they know to be unhealthful. God demands that the appetites be cleansed and that self-denial be practiced in regard to those things which are not good. This is a work that will have to be done when? Before, before his people can stand before him, a perfected people. And we read again, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. My friends, are we preparing to stand before our Father in heaven, a perfected people? Are we willing to listen to the light that we have been given to help this happen? These are all things that help our character. These are things getting away in the way of our character perfection. This is not punishment. God is trying to bring us home. Are we willing to go home? There's good news, all my friends. As difficult as these things might be to overcome, there is good news. It is a sin. Yes, it is a sin to destroy their physical, mental, and spiritual energies. And they must understand how to cooperate with God in their own restoration. Through faith in Christ, they can overcome. Through faith in Christ, my friends, we can overcome. If we allow Christ's righteousness to work within and that work to come out in cooperation, this is righteous by faith. Cooperation is involved in righteousness by faith. Let's read about this union. Through union with Christ. Union, partnership, cooperation. Through acceptance of His righteousness by faith, we may be qualified to work the works of God, to be collaborators with Christ. We're talking cooperation. If you are willing to drift along with the current of evil in order that everlasting righteousness may be brought in, you do not have faith. You do not have faith. Through faith, the Holy Spirit works in the heart, but this cannot be done unless the human agent will work with Christ. In order that we may have the righteousness of Christ, we need daily to be transformed by the influence of the Holy Spirit. My friends, every time we make that choice to choose this, whatever that might be, over the Holy Spirit, we're closing a door. There is no faith. There is no righteousness. And my friends, faith without works is dead. Are we cooperating? Are we cooperating? Are we willing to be faithful in the little things? Now, I know for some of us, these are not little things. But let's read about it. The structure of a strong, well-balanced character is made by a faithful performance of individual acts of duty in little things, your deportment, the spirit, and feelings that you cherish, care, and thoughtfulness in the things which are least in everyday life form the true test of character. Remember what we said earlier, who we are as a person, our character is a result of who has our heart. Are we truly committed unto the Lord? Amos 3.3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? as we mentioned earlier. These little things, tea and coffee, sweets, whatever they might be, every time we choose these over the light we've been given, 
the Holy Spirit sits on the sidelines. Are we agreed? No, if we're agreed, we would let these go. We would let these go and we say, yes, I agree with the light that you are giving me. I am wholeheartedly willing, willing to live by that light. Please allow me to, because I can only do this with Christ working within me, because we know how hard it is to overcome these things. And every encouraging word has been given. Every encouragement is given God's people for ultimate progress and improvement. We are to work as if we knew we were in sight of the whole universe of heaven. And through Christ, and through Christ say, I will not fail nor be discouraged, but hope for everything in moral advancement and the restoration of the image of God in man. At every step, our prayer should ascend to the throne of God while working as if everything depended upon our diligence and faithfulness. Yet we must make God our only dependence. This is righteous by faith. This is cooperation. This is true, a true partnership. My friends, what does that look like? It looks like our baptismal vow. When we go to the Father and we say, Father, I am sorry I come to you in faith. I repent. I am sorry that I have ignored the light that you have given me. I do commit my ways unto you, but I can't do it on my own. I need Christ's righteousness working within me. Or I can't do this. And Christ steps in. And what does Christ say? Oh, with me, you can do it. And Christ reaches out his hand. He says, take my hand. And we take his hand. And Christ says, now take a step. I want you to step there and step there. And we step there and we step there. And Christ gives us more light and more light. And he says, now I want you to step there, now there. And he takes us home. Christ takes us home. This is a partnership. This is righteousness by faith. It is your own efforts through Christ which will bring you perfection of Christian character. We're going to read that again. It is your own efforts through Christ. My friends, it's okay to try. It's okay to try. As long as you realize that, is, that it's Christ doing the trying. That it's Christ doing the trying. If we're not trying, we don't have Christ. My friends, it's okay to try. That is righteousness working out through you. And it's the only way we will ever achieve perfection of Christian character. And we read on. It says, when a path of duty is open before you, you are not to consult your own convenience, but by living faith, you are to walk in the path of humble obedience. Again, this is righteousness by faith, my friends. We can't do it of our own, but Christ can't do it without us. All who enter heaven will do so as conquerors. You will have a battle to fight. Oh, it's not going to be easy. We need to pause there because it's not going to be easy. No, it's not going to be easy. Paul is a good example. His last words were what? I fought the good fight of faith. Did Paul reach perfection? No, he didn't reach perfection, but he strove for it every day of his life through Christ. On our dying breath, Will it be, I fought the good fight of faith? Or will it be, I threw in the white towel? I threw in the white towel. I don't want that to be my last words. It's going to be a struggle. Let's read on. You will have to overcome difficulties by strong, determined effort. But eternal life is worth a lifelong, persevering effort. A lifelong, persevering effort. We can do nothing without Christ, my friends. We can do nothing without Christ. But if we are doing nothing, then we are without Christ. While God was working in Daniel and his companions to will and to do his good pleasure, they were working out their own salvation. What does that mean? How are they doing that? They were living up to the light that they had been given. The light on diet and health. They were living up to it. They were doing all that they could, all within their ability, that Christ might work within them, that they might glorify the Father and the Son. And we read on. Herein is revealed the outworking of the divine principle of cooperation, 
Without it, no true success can be attained. No true success can be attained without cooperation. Human effort avails nothing without divine power. Amen. And without human endeavor, divine effort is with many of no avail. To make God's grace our own, we must act our part. His grace is given to work in us, to will and to do, but never as a substitute for our effort. Never as a substitute for our effort. I think a good example of this is the Garmin in our car. Let's say we're lost on some deserted road somewhere. No idea where we're at. But we have our Garmin. And we have faith in our Garmin. And we turn that Garmin on. And we push the go home button. And Garmin says, turn right at the light. And we, we believe. We go, okay, Garmin's going to get us home. What do we do? We start that engine. We put it in gear and we move forward. And when we get to that light, we go right. And then Garmin might say, at the next light, go left. And we go left. And what happens? Garmin takes us home. Garmin takes us home, as Christ will. But what if we're sitting back in that car, sitting there idle, and saying, okay, take me home, Garmin, and we don't start that engine. We don't put it in gear. Are we going home? No, we're not going home. That's not righteousness by faith. That's not righteousness, and there is no faith. My friends, it all comes down to are we willing? Are we willing to change? If we are not willing to change, we're not going to. If we don't desire Christ's righteousness, we can never attain it. And there is no faith. And the Holy Spirit sits on the sidelines. Are we willing? The only hope for us, if we would overcome, is to unite our will with God's will and work in cooperation with Him. Pride and self-sufficiency must be crucified. Are we willing to pay the price required of us? Are we willing to have our will brought into perfect conformity with the will of God? Until we are willing, the transforming grace of God cannot manifest upon us. If we are not willing, we will never experience righteousness by faith. Are we willing? Are we willing? Let's look at another example here. Let's say we're now sitting idle on the sofa. We're probably watching TV or something of the sorts. And we have a freezer full of meat. Now as Adventists, we know we shouldn't be eating meat. Well, we've got a freezer full of meat. Do you think the Holy Spirit is with us at that point? Maybe, maybe so, but on the sideline. We're ignoring the influence of the Holy Spirit. We might not have that plate of meat in front of us at that moment, but we have full intent of eating that meat, emptying that freezer into our gut. And the Holy Spirit sits on the sideline because we are denying that light. It is blocked. The Holy Spirit is blocked from access. So what do we do? What if we go to the Savior in faith and say, I am sorry. I am sorry. I don't want this anymore. I don't want this anymore. I do want to commit my ways unto you, but I can't do it. Again, we say the same thing. We can't do it because we can't do it. Christ says, I'll help you. Again, please take my hand once again. Let's do this. And Christ says, put a foot there. Put a foot there. Another over there. Walk over to that freezer. Empty that freezer. Empty it. Donate that meat or throw it out if you have to. Get rid of it. Maybe it's that coffee pot we need to walk over to, the sweets. Maybe there's a bottle of booze in the cabinet. Maybe we need to empty some clothes out of the closet that we know we shouldn't be wearing. Is that our works? Are we trying to work our way to heaven? No, that's Christ working within us. That's in faith, righteousness, doing its job. It's not our merits. Are we trying to be saved by our merits? No, we're saved by Christ's merits. But what if we sit back on that sofa and we don't move and we sit there idle? Is there any righteousness? Is there any faith? No, there isn't, is there? My friends, we must be cooperating. We must be willing. Are we truly willing? And it's not going to be easy. It's going to take faith. It's going to take prayer and a willing effort. And let's read about that. 
Prayer and effort, effort and prayer will be the business of your life. You must pray as though the efficiency and praise were all due to God and labor as though duty were all your own. If you want power, you may have it as it is waiting your draft upon it. Only believe in God. Take him at his word. Act by faith and blessings will come. Blessings will come, my friends. We are to do all that we can do on our part to fight the good fight of faith. We are to wrestle, to labor, to strive, to, to agonize, to enter in at the straight gate. We are to set the Lord ever before us with clean hands, with pure hearts. We are to seek to honor God in all our ways. Help has been provided for us in him who is mighty to save. The spirit of truth and light will quicken and renew us by its mysterious workings. For all our spiritual improvement comes from God, not from ourselves. The true worker will have divine power to aid him, but the idler will not be sustained by the spirit of God. The idler will not be sustained by the spirit of God. In one way, we are thrown upon our own energies. We are to strive earnestly, to be zealous and to repent, to cleanse our hands and purify our hearts with every defilement. We are to reach the highest standard, believing that God will help us in our efforts. Let's pause there for a second, because what we saw is our baptismal vow, isn't it? In faith, we repent and we commit our ways unto the Lord. We're willing to go to that higher standard. And through Christ, we can achieve this. And we read on, we must seek if we would find and seek in faith. We must knock that the door may be opened unto us. Are we knocking? Are we knocking? The Bible teaches that everything regarding our salvation depends upon our own course of action. If we perish, the responsibility rests wholly upon ourselves. If provision has been made, and if we accept God's terms, not our terms, my friends, we may lay hold on eternal life. We must come to Christ in faith. We must be diligent to make our calling and election sure. Are we acting out our faith? Are we living up to the light that we have been given? Have we truly committed our ways unto the Lord? Are we keeping our promise? Are we keeping our baptismal vow? Have we truly given our whole heart? Or are we just as a faded and dying rose? A faded and dying rose. Those who choose to become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king, must reveal their choice by bringing their words and actions into harmony with the principles they advocate. My brother, my sister, is the kingdom of God enthroned in your heart by Christ's presence abiding there? Or is self still a controlling power? Whose subject are you? If a selfish spirit continues to keep you out of Christ's service, Pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Pray, oh, pray most earnestly. Put thy spirit, Lord, thy Holy Spirit within my heart that I may be sincere in keeping my baptismal vow. Pray that, inter that the intercession of Christ in your behalf shall not be in vain. Pray that unbelief shall no longer lead you to a life that bears witness against the truth, no longer lead you to claim to be in God's service while in the life practice because of perverted will. You reveal that you are not bearing the fruits of the Spirit. Pray for power to demonstrate to the world that you are dead to sin and that your life is indeed hid with Christ in God. Are we hid with Christ in God, my friends? Are we hid with Christ in God? Are we preparing to stand before God? Are we preparing to stand before God? Do it for God, my friends. Do it for God. They are to remember that Jesus sees all they do and hears all they say. They are to work cheerfully, serving God to the best of their ability, doing His will from the hearts. Let them remember that they are doing it for God. Are we doing it for God? Even in these little things, even in these little things, we can make God smile. Let's read about that. 
It is little things which test the character. It is the unpretending acts of daily self-denial with cheerfulness and gentleness that God smiles upon. Oh, how beautiful. I want to make God smile. Do you want to make God smile? Oh, there's more. When God smiles upon our efforts, it is worth more than any earthly income. And it is, my friends. When we make God smile in these little things, it is worth so much more than any earthly income. Is the joy of the Lord our strength? Are we willing to say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth? Our opening scripture, we're going to read it once again. It says, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Are we truly willing to seek with our whole heart? Our closing scripture is found in Mark 12, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. In that opening scene, we saw a red rose symbolizing a loving commitment. The way many of us have seen our relationship with Christ and as we have learned through this presentation, for many of us, we are nothing but a fading and dying yellow rose at best. But this is where we need to be, my friends, a white rose. A white rose is set a standard above a red rose. A white rose stands for purity and eternal loyalty. This is where we need to strive. My friends, Christ is coming soon. The bridegroom, the bridegroom cometh. Are we willing to put on that white robe? Are we willing to put on that white robe of righteousness? My friends, we've seen a few things here. Maybe your problem isn't your diet. Maybe it's something else. Whatever it is, are we truly willing? Are you truly willing to commit your ways unto the Lord with your whole heart? Are you willing to surrender? Turn it over to Christ. Take him by his hand and take the steps he asks you to take. My friends, are we truly committed with our whole heart? Are we truly willing to give our whole heart to our Savior? Because he's willing to take you home if you're willing to follow. For those who can, may we please kneel for a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for being with us, dear Lord. We thank you so much for your presence. And I pray, dear Lord, that you will give us the courage and the strength, the willingness to commit our ways unto you, to give our whole hearts unto you. Please take us home. Please take us home, dear Lord, and please give us that willing heart. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth Pioneer Health and Missions